In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I have made a covenant with my elect. I have sworn to David my servant. Thy seed will I settle forever, and I will build up thy throne unto generation and generation. These words of the psalm refer to the perpetuity of Christ's throne until the end of time on this earth. This reign of Christ on earth is accomplished by the kingdom of God, which he founded, which is the church which he founded, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Our Lord wished not to remain upon the earth, but to confide his kingdom to men who would teach, rule, and sanctify the human race in his name and with his constant assistance. He said to them, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. What magnificent words, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. He prefaces his words with that statement. Going therefore teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. These words coming forth from the possessor of all power in heaven and in earth constitute the solemn mission to the apostles and their successors to teach rule and sanctify the human race in Christ's name and with his perpetual assistance. These words constitute the church's credentials to the human race as the one true church of the one true God. This power to teach, to rule, and to sanctify by means of the power of God it pertains to the very essence of the Catholic Church and distinguishes her essentially from anything else which claims to be a church or a religion. In order to carry on this sacred mission, however, it is necessary that the apostles have successors in the holy priesthood and the episcopacy. For this reason, our Lord instituted the sacrament of holy orders, which confers on the priest the ultimate power of sanctification, which is the offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the essence of which is the transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is this power to transubstantiate that we will confer today. The power to sanctify souls is the greatest of all of the powers of the church, since the church's supreme law is the salvation of souls. The power to teach is given in order to sanctify souls, since they must be sanctified in truth, as our blessed Lord said. The first and most fundamental sanctity, that is the first and most fundamental way in which we are like God, is by the embracing of his truth, this embracing of his truth is none other than the virtue of faith, without which it is impossible to please God, as St. Paul says in his epistle to the Hebrews. 
Similar, similarly, the power to rule the faithful in the name of God, that is, the church's power to make laws, is ordered to the sanctity of the soul. And so, sanctity is the greatest of all of the marks of the church. And the salvation of souls is the greatest of all of the laws of the church. And all of her laws bend to the salvation of souls. A pope, bishop, or even a priest, a parish priest, a pastor, is given jurisdiction to rule the faithful because precisely he has the power to sanctify them through the sacrament of holy orders. A lay person could be validly elected pope or appointed a bishop, as in the case of St. Ambrose, but he cannot obtain the power to rule the church until he should first consent to receive holy orders. For the power to rule is ordered to sanctification, and holy orders is ordered to sanctification. It is precisely for this purpose that we have come here today to perform this sacred ceremony of the continuation unto generation and generation the Catholic priesthood. Forty-one years ago today, I went through this same ceremony. But as the years pass by, I grow old and soon will die. And the younger generations must come up after me and do what I have done. And that is why today is a day of great joy, just as when a little baby is born, a new life that will carry on the human race. So this is a new sacerdotal life which will carry on the sanctification of souls. But this is no common ordination. This ordination today is done in order to preserve and advance the sanctification of souls in the midst of a catastrophic loss of faith as a result of the Second Vatican Council and its subsequent reforms. There has been, since Vatican II, many who have reacted to its errors. After these 50 years of Vatican II and of the reaction to it, we see, in addition to the catastrophic effects of Vatican II itself, the catastrophe of the reaction to these errors. What I am referring to is the fact that most of those who have in any way found Vatican II and its reforms to be wanting or lacking, have followed a path of willingness to compromise with these reforms and to be co-religionists with those who have promoted and accepted these reforms. As I have said many times, the fundamental question which every Catholic must pose to himself as he examines Vatican II and its effects is this. Do Vatican II and its subsequent reforms constitute a continuity with the Catholicism before the Council or do they constitute a rupture? Is the religion which we find in our parishes today the same religion as before Vatican II? That is, a religion which professes exactly the same dogmas, exactly the same moral doctrines, a religion which uses a mass whose ceremonies portray and teach the Church's doctrines concerning the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood, and whose laws and disciplines are essentially the same as those before Vatican II. Neither prescribing nor permitting anything contrary to faith or morals. That is the question that we must pose, each of us as a Catholic. 
Is it the same religion? If the answer to this question is yes, that is, it is the same religion as before Vatican II, then we waste our time here today. Indeed, we commit a mortal sin. For in such a case, there would be absolutely no justification to reject the Council and its reforms. To do so would be schismatic. On the other hand, if the answer is no, that is, Vatican II and its reforms are not a homogeneous continuation of Catholic dogma, moral teaching, liturgy, and discipline, but in fact constitute a new and false religion, then the only course for the Catholic is the utter rejection of this new religion in the name of holy faith and the utter rejection of any claim of those who promulgate this new religion to teach, rule, and sanctify the Church. For the powers to teach and rule exist for the sanctification of souls, as I said. He who intends to substitute a new religion for the Catholic faith in the Church's institutions has no power to teach and consequently has no power to rule or to sanctify. For the foundation of all sanctity, as I have said, is the assent to the truths revealed by God and taught by the Catholic Church. If the modernists cannot have the commission from Christ, the head of the Church, to teach because of their intention to impose a defection from the faith, then they cannot have the commission from God to sanctify the faithful. They are incapable of it if they intend to impose a new and false religion. For this reason, St. Thomas Aquinas says that masses, although valid, which are offered outside the church, do not give grace because precisely the priest is not acting in the person of the church. That is, he is not acting as an agent of the church of which Christ is the head. For all sanctity comes from Christ the Savior as he is the head of the church. And consequently, he who is cut off from Christ through heresy cannot sanctify in his name. If we look upon what is commonly called the traditional movement, the collection of those who find Vatican II and its reforms to be faulty and lacking to a greater or lesser extent, we discover that nearly all of them either do actually accept the Novus Ordo religion as a form of Catholicism, or they aspire to be one of them. They are either co-religionists with those who profess the new religion, or they desire to be co-religionists and to be subject to the Novus Ordo hierarchy. Let us examine this for a moment. In order that Catholics be co-religionists with those who profess the new religion of Vatican II, it is necessary that the religion of Vatican II merit to be called Catholic. This means that all of the documents of Vatican II must be free from error. It means that all of the liturgical practices approved by Vatican II must be free from error. It means that all of the magisterium of John XXIII and of the subsequent Vatican II claimants to the papacy must be entirely free from error and that all of the approved laws 
and disciplines of the post-Vatican II religion must not prescribe or permit anything contrary to Catholic morality. It means that all of the practices of the post-Vatican II religion, whether officially approved or approved by the silence of those who should condemn, are in complete accordance with the Catholic faith, with Catholic morals and discipline and liturgy. Only in such a case would the religion of Vatican II merit to be called Catholic, for that term Catholic is very demanding. It demands perfect conformity to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the Holy Catholic Church, infallible and indefectible. Now we have only to consider the errors of ecumenism, of the new ecclesiology, of religious liberty, and of collegiality, all of which are found in the Council. We have only to consider the abominations against the first commandment of God perpetrated by John Paul II in the name of ecumenism, the placing of the Buddha on the top of the tabernacle, for example, or the kissing of the Koran. We have only to consider the new order of the Mass, rightly called by Archbishop Lefebvre the Mass of Luther. We have only to consider the innumerable sacrilegious liturgical acts of the Novus Ordo, the dancing girls, the balloons, the clowns, and many, many other weird and sick liturgies which have been concocted by them. We have only to consider the sacrilegious practice of giving Holy Communion to non-Catholics, to the divorced and remarried, to those living in sin. If we place the name of Catholic upon the religion of Vatican II, we have to place side by side with the magisterium of all of the popes of Catholic history, the error and heresy laden teachings of the claimants to the papal throne since Vatican II. Next to the magnificent allocutions of a St. Pius X, we must place the sayings of a Bergoglio, that there is no Catholic God, that the unity of the divine essence is God's spray, that does not exist, and that Martin Luther did not err concerning justification which he said just a few days ago. All of those things take their place on the shelf, side by side, with the magnificent teachings of the popes through the ages. That is what happens when you give the Novus Ordo the title of Catholic. Here I have given you a mere sample of all that is wrong with Vatican II and its reforms were we to thoroughly enumerate the deviations of the new religion from Catholicism, we would be here for many, many hours and perhaps days. Vatican II and its reforms were accomplished not by wolves in sheep's clothing, but by wolves in shepherd's clothing. They have slaughtered nearly all of the sheep in the sheepfold. As far as the eye can see, there is nothing but the bloodied carcasses of the sheep. That is, Catholics who once had the faith, but who have now lost it because they have been devoured by the wolves of Vatican II, wolves whose shepherd costumes become daily more and more scanty. What is yet more tragic is that those who aspire to stop the carnage have themselves been lured into the wolves' mouths, or want to be, leaving only a tiny number 
of, of the once immense Catholic population who refused to identify the new religion with Roman Catholicism. These considerations place a new light on what we do here today. For we ordain a priest who refuses to be a co-religionist with the Novus Ordo hierarchy. It is only through priests and bishops like him that the once enormous Catholic Church will pass unscathed like a great ship through the narrow canal of fidelity to the Church's traditions. The Society of St. Pius X recently boasted of having now 600 priests. They have built a grandiose seminary in Virginia. But to what purpose? To lead these priests and the people who follow them into the jaws of the wolves? For in accepting to be the co-religionists with the Novus Ordo hierarchy, or aspiring thereto, they are implicitly asserting that Vatican II and its reforms are substantially Catholic. In saying this, they destroy the very reason for any resistance to Vatican II and its changes. Destroy it. We will never admit that Vatican II and its reforms are substantially Catholic. In 1916, the Germans unleashed a terrifying force of men and artillery against the fortress of Verdun in eastern France for the sole purpose of breaking the French resolve to fight, for Verdun was not a strategic thing to take. They wanted to break their resolve, but the French soldiers endured excruciating and indescribable sufferings in order to keep out the invading Germans. Their motto was, ils ne passeront pas, that is, they shall not pass, and pass they did not. Likewise, we will never permit the heresies and errors of Vatican II and its reforms to pass for Roman Catholicism. No, not ever. The great 20th century theologian Garrigou Lagrange once said, a thousand idiots do not equal one genius. So by analogy, we may say that 600 priests who are willing to let Vatican II pass for Roman Catholicism do not equal one who refuses. They are like an army which has been trained not to fight the enemy, but to join them. Of what good is an army of 600 which is trained to throw down its arms before the enemy? St. Pius X said that the modernists are the worst enemies ever to assail the Catholic Church, and we will forever treat them as such, as an enemy, not as a co-religionist. For these reasons, what we do here today is the most important event in the world. It transcends all of the political problems that you will read about in the news. It transcends all of the vacillations of Wall Street, all of which will pass away with time. No one will remember them. What we do today is the most important event in the world. This tiny patch of land on which we stand is among the import, most important places of the world. For it is in this institution and the few others like it on this planet that Catholicism will make its stand. 
and will not permit the enemy to pass and will, by the training and ordination of uncompromising priests, build up the throne of Christ and of his church from generation unto generation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.